Hi everybody, this is the lecture to accompany chapter 7 in your textbook. Please carefully read chapter 7. There's a lot of information in it I don't have time to discuss. Okay, let's talk about creative thinking and critical thinking. If you've ever been to New York City, you may have gone for a walk on the High Line. That's a park created from an old freight train line. It's one example of the rails to trails movement that's the basis for our case study in Chapter 7. Ozark Greenways, Incorporated was formed in Missouri to promote the preservation of green space in the Midwest by building these kinds of linear parks. One of their major challenges was to figure out a way for one of these parks to cross the Kansas Expressway safely. They needed to find a solution that met their criteria of safety, cost, and ease of use. When groups take on challenges like this, there are two distinct but equally important processes they need to use, creative thinking and critical thinking. Both are necessary to come up with the best solution. Creative thinking has to do with coming up with new and different ideas. It encourages things like hunches, intuition, insight, and fantasy to promote those new ideas. In the business world, companies that tolerate risk-taking and understand that mistakes may be a part of the creative process, but have teams that work well together, are often ones that come up with innovative ideas that lead to new products and inventions that improve our lives. Group creativity involves both divergent and convergent thinking. In divergent thinking, Group members try to think very differently from one another. Individuals are not necessarily trying to immediately think of the best solution. What's more important at this point is the quantity and the breadth of the ideas that are generated. It's okay to be a little crazy at this point. No ideas should be criticized. Then, at some point, convergent thinking comes into play and group members constructively debate the ideas to narrow them down to things that will actually work. Successful teams tend to have shorter divergent thinking periods and longer convergent thinking periods. You certainly want to play and put some fun and interesting ideas out there, but at some point your group has to rein it in and work towards the best solution. So what aspects of groups can foster creative thinking? Well, first is members have to be willing to communicate with each other and encourage each other to think outside the box. They should be at least somewhat tolerant of ambiguity, which means not immediately coming to a decision, but letting it be somewhat vague, at least in the beginning. Not be afraid of rejection, be open to new ideas, and really want to have fun with the process. Groups who have diverse knowledge of a topic will be able to come up with more creative ideas and be willing to look at group norms that might stifle the creative process. They should also work to develop a group climate that makes creative thinking easier to accomplish. And the environment a group works within is also important to how successful a group will be with the creative process. The company they work for should put a high value on creativity and be willing to give the group some autonomy for the creative process to be successful. The text gives you examples of three different ways to foster creativity. I'm going to go over them briefly, but please make sure you read through these processes carefully so that you understand them. First, brainstorming. This is a very common process. You've probably done it either by yourself or in a group previously. There are some variations to the process, but it's generally done as follows. First, everyone agrees on what will happen, particularly the need to initially allow the free expression of ideas. Then the problems presented to the group and members are allowed to generate ideas without criticism. Someone records all the ideas and they're available for everyone to see. The whole point is to generate the largest quantity of ideas, not to determine at this point which ideas are the best. Once a list is generated, the group should wait for a while until a different meeting to evaluate the ideas, which will give individuals time to process them. Another way to stimulate creative thinking is by using metaphors and analogies. This process is called synectics. The book uses the example of how Velcro was created to illustrate this process. Its developer noticed that Cockleburs stuck to his jacket and thought how it might be a good way to fasten things together. A cockleburr is somewhat like a fastener. Velcro sprang from that metaphor. 
In synectics, the group identifies the essence of the problem and then attempts to imagine analogies that capture that essence. What is this problem like? What can it be compared to? It can really help to look at things from an entirely different perspective. Finally, appreciative inquiry looks at the problem differently. Instead of focusing on what's wrong and how can it be fixed, this process starts by focusing on strengths and building from there. Because its focus is immediately on the positive instead of the negative, team members may be more motivated and committed to improving and changing things. This works very well for companies that are trying to improve things like customer service and product delivery. The four steps are, Discover, what do we already do well? Dream, imagine what we could do if things were different. Design, what changes do we need to come up with to make that dream a reality? And finally, destiny, what exactly do we need to do to implement those changes? As you can see, creative thinking is an essential ingredient in the problem solving process. By the way, you might be curious about how the Ozarks Greenway people solved their problem of what to do with the trail where it met up with the Kansas Expressway. Well, they utilized brainstorming and synectics. Imagine flying over the traffic on the expressway and came up with a dedicated walking and biking overpass above the expressway. Creative thinking is the first part of the problem solving process. Let's now look at the second essential part critical thinking. Creative thinking might be intuitive and spontaneous, but critical thinking is the exact opposite. It's thoughtful and thorough, using evidence, logic, and reasoning to carefully determine your conclusions. The solution to a problem is determined by looking at all the facts, data, opinions, and other information about a claim and using the best reasoning and logic to come up with the best possible solution. The most important thing that members must bring to this process is an attitude that is conducive to good critical thinking. You must be open-minded, and by that I don't mean you should just believe everything you hear or see. What I mean is that you should be willing to consider new information even if it doesn't immediately back up your beliefs and ideas about the world. Consider it, not just believe it. Look for relevant information from a variety of sources and different perspectives. Be willing to ask probing questions and don't jump to conclusions. Look at the issue and the evidence for each claim. The term skeptic tends to have a negative connotation and out in the world it's often used to incorrectly mean someone who doesn't believe anything no matter what the evidence says. True skeptics want to see all the evidence and information available before they come to a conclusion and are willing to change their mind if new, valid, credible evidence is presented to them. To them, critical thinking is an active process that involves testing information. Table 7.2 in the book has a list of probing questions that good critical thinkers ask, like what evidence do you have to suggest that statement's true? What's the source of that evidence? How did you come to that conclusion? Questions like these attempt to get at the truth and are important to ask as you discuss possible solutions. Groups must organize ideas in order to think critically about their problems, which requires members to gather and evaluate necessary information, check for errors in their reasoning, and avoid something called groupthink, which can lead to errors in decision making. Let's look at each of these things. First, the group needs to do research to gather information about the topic. You may already have some information about it, but you'll need to obtain more. It's a good idea to take stock of what you already have or know and talk about what other kinds of information you're going to need. You'll also need to assign members specific responsibilities to get items of information and use appropriate information gathering techniques, such as going somewhere to observe something happening like a town hall meeting where your topic's being discussed, or going to the library to do some research on the topic, or interviewing someone with information critical to the topic, or watching television shows, or listening to radio programs or podcasts about the topic. The best way to collect information is to get it from a variety of good, reliable sources. Then, once you've collected the information, you need to evaluate it for meaning, source credibility, 
and accuracy, your group cannot afford to base your conclusions on incorrect, overly biased, or outdated information. So you need to determine exactly what the author is saying. What conclusions are they reaching? What evidence are they using to reach those conclusions? Is what they are saying fact or opinion? You need to be able to tell the difference. A basic news article is different from an opinion piece. Clarify any unfamiliar terms. Is the source or author credible? Do they have any biases that might sway their opinions or conclusions? Lack of objectivity does not necessarily mean you can't use someone's information, but you should be skeptical of it and seek to corroborate it with other experts on the topic. And you also need to make sure that the facts are indeed true. Is the information current? Is it up to date? You may need to find information from other reliable sources to back up the facts. Then, and this is a very important part of the critical thinking process, you need to assess the quality of the reasoning that the group uses to come to its conclusions. Fallacies are errors in reasoning that often sound correct, but actually might lead to incorrect conclusions or divert attention to irrelevancies. There are far more fallacies than are listed here, but these are some of the most common. Please read about them in the textbook as there are some good illustrations that are used to clarify what they are and how they're used so that your group can recognize them and avoid them. Overgeneralizing, also known as hasty generalization, is when you come to a conclusion based on too little information. One example of something does not a conclusion make. You need to have enough evidence that something is indeed the case before deciding that it is. Personal attack, also known as ad hominem, is basically a form of insult and name calling that diverts attention away from a person's claim and evidence and focuses it instead on some quality or character of that person that the attacker sees as negative. Confusing causal relationships have to do with saying one thing causes another thing without having evidence. Even if two things are related somehow, that doesn't mean that there's a cause-effect relationship between them. Either-or thinking, also called false dilemma, ignores all the different choices that might be possible and says that you either have to choose one thing or the other. There are rarely only two solutions to a problem. But either-or thinking distracts people away from all the other possibilities. And incomplete comparisons, also called false analogies, try to compare things that might have something in common and say that what's true for one is also true for the other. But if the resemblance between those things doesn't fit with the conclusion you're trying to draw, then the analogy breaks down. Like I said, there are lots of other fallacies out there, but your group can avoid them by asking probing questions during the discussion process and carefully listening to each other. Finally, your group needs to work to avoid groupthink, which can happen in groups with excessively high cohesiveness, and cohesiveness can otherwise be a good thing as long as you're aware of groupthink and work to avoid it. A group that overestimates its power and morality, that thinks it can do no wrong, that becomes close-minded to outside information, where the group members are pressuring each other to conform, can become a victim of groupthink. Table 7.7 .7 in the text has some good ideas for groups to help them avoid or counteract this tendency, like making sure you don't come to a premature conclusion before thoroughly discussing the problem and potential solutions. In conclusion, group members must use both creative thinking and critical thinking skills to be effective problem solvers. I hope you've learned some ways that you can do both well. This is the end of the lecture on Chapter 7.